now we have my very well presented panels of witnesses. I'd like to call up Randy Rosenbaum, Executive Director, Steve Feinberg, Film and TV Office Director, and Bill Brackett, Chairman of the Rhode Island Council on the Arts. Welcome, gentlemen. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, I thought I'd just start off by, because there are some people who may not have heard testimony from the State Arts Council before, just give you a, a, a thumbnail sketch of who we are and our place within state government. And I go around the state from time to time talking about the Arts Council and its operations. And I, I usually contextualize the Arts Council by saying, okay, if you think about the Department of Environmental Management, this is an organization that's tasked with protecting the environment of our state and promoting and advancing environmental causes in Rhode Island. If you think about the Department of Health, it's, it's designed to protect the health and, and well-being of our citizens. Well, we consider the arts and culture to be an important uh, asset for the state of Rhode Island. It's an asset that continues to get national attention, as some of our panelists will describe. Whenever there's a story in the New York Times, if it's not about uh, the politics of Rhode Island, it's usually about the cultural assets and amenities of our state. And this is, this is something that returns a great deal on the very small investment that the state of Rhode Island makes in the arts. Currently, the appropriation that's under consideration by your committee and by the General Assembly accounts for about seven one hundredths of one percent of the general fund. Uh, so it's a small amount, but it generates a great deal of economic return as well as educational return and an enormous return on the quality of life that we enjoy here Steve. in Rhode Island. I'll be brief. Uh, Chairman, nice to be here, members. Uh, the Rhode Island Film and TV Office, I believe it was in 2003, was put under the uh, uh, Rhode Island Council on the Arts. I came in April of 2004, and I'm very happy that the Film and TV Office is part of the Council on the Arts because uh, we've had fantastic collaborations. I'll just give you... We, our funding is being reduced for this upcoming year, but there's one thing that everybody has to keep in mind when it comes to funding for the arts. We're an economic generator. We generate money, which means if our funding is lowered, what we generate is going to be proportionately lower. And you'll hear some people talk uh, to I'm that. I'm Burke issue. Crank. I'm the founder and the director of ASU 20 in Providence. Um, and I just want to, I mean, I wasn't, didn't know that I was going to be giving testimony, so I apologize that you're not going to get the two-hour defense of art and culture, because I'm not, I don't have my PowerPoint with me, so it's going to be a little quicker. We started in 1985, didn't become a 501c3 until somewhat later. We received our first risk of grant. It was about $5,000 a project grant uh, in 1986, I think. Today, we have developed three buildings in downtown Providence, 100,000 square feet of space, 20, almost $25 million of investment in downtown. Much of that main money came from out of state through federal and histor historic and new market tax credits. Um, ASU 20, independent of the commercial businesses in our buildings, have created 50 jobs. Okay, this is real. Two and a half million dollar budget. Uh, we have a fab lab, print shop, our performance space, exhibition space, a youth program dedicated to working with kids in and out of the training school. We've had a number of those kids who have created portfolios with us, who have gotten scholarships into colleges and universities. These are kids are coming out of the training school in DCYF. We work with foster care kids. Um, other businesses that we help incubate and bring to another level, there's a barber shop, a couple of well-managed bars, a Mexican restaurant that's going in, all of which have sort of upgraded in the process of the development and the conversations that we've had with them, always with local businesses. Um, and I talk a little bit about the branding of the state and the, and the, and the city. You know, th this whole idea of art, culture, and design, and this idea of new economies, creative economies, knowledge economy, this is the real deal. This is happening. This is where we're headed. Small business in, in design, digital design, in all of the different areas, okay? Um, I'm not one of those people who are negative about the investment that you all made and the risks that you're taking with uh, 38 Studios. I think there's a, an enormous amount of potential there, and I think it's going to yield results. And it's already, they're moving in as we speak in the building across from AS220. Not bad for our restaurant, 
Okay, uh, I mean, I'm, this is all, it all is symbiotic, and it's a relatively small investment for $25 million of investment in the downtown area as a result. Uh, so we talked a little bit about branding, and I'm going to finish right now real quick because you didn't get the two-hour presentation, and we pay property tax, okay? So in our performance when we developed our buildings, it, with the very, very much with the intention of being good citizens, as an organization, we performed property taxes in our, in our projects. I will tell you that on the Empire Street one, we cut a deal there where we pay uh, predominantly on the, just on the commercial tenants, but on our other two developments, which are even bigger, we pay on the, in the entire property, okay? So th I can't think of a better investment and that original investment was $5,000. The next good idea that plays into this creative economy and all this, and these things all tie in and bridge to each other, from the digital design stuff to the fine art stuff, it all plays into each other and creates an environment that is inviting people into this community to be developing these kinds of businesses. Um, so, you know, one recommendation, let's take a million dollars from the EDC and put it into the State Arts Council and up their budget. Oh, no, we ain't going to do that. Um, anyway, thank you very, very, very much for the attack. Because it's efficient. It's efficient. Okay? Enough. <laughs> I can dovetail. Pardon me. I can dovetail on to... Uh, to, to what's been said by, by Bert, um, the arts are efficient. Spending money on arts organizations through RISCA, the state gets a lot of bang for its buck. Our taxpayers get a lot of bang for their buck. Uh, and I'll give you an example uh, using my organization. I'm David Beauchene. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Rhode Island Philharmonic Orchestra and Music School. Uh, the state portion of our RISCA grant is just a little over $40,000. Uh, this year, and that's been pretty consistent over the last few years. It's gone down a little bit over the last four years. Um, we employ 325 staff, artists, uh, and and teachers through our organization. We pay uh, through because of that staff. We pay $160,000 in state payroll taxes back to the state. So already, just on payroll taxes alone, the state's uh, got a really good return on its investment. Then you add to that fact that we generate an estimated $400,000 a year in state sales taxes through the related spending that people do when they come to our events, like parking in parking garages, going to restaurants, uh, and all the other things that they do. Also, our students buy musical instruments, music, et cetera, and this generates sales tax revenue for the state. So like AS220, the Philharmonic is a taxpayer, even though we're nonprofit, or a tax generator, even though we're nonprofit. And uh, this really is more than 10 times the amount that we get through our risk of grant. So the, the, the state's getting 10 times its return on its uh, investment. Joe DiBattista, um, uh, I own commercial property uh, in downtown Providence, and I manage commercial property in downtown Providence full time. And, and I know the arts are helping not only my business, but a lot of other businesses in, in the downtown area as well. And, and we have it all. I know, I, know what it's, I know what it's like when the uh, Trinity is going strong and PPAC's going strong and something's going on at the convention center and the dunk and the city's alive and you can just about get around. We, <laughs> we have it all. So whatever, whatever the state can do to help support the arts, please continue it. <laughs> My name is Wendy Warlick, Thank and you. I'm a parent of two um, students who go to the Barton Gregorian Elementary School at Fox Point. I'm also an artist and co-founder of the I Was There project at our school, uh, which has received funding from RISCA for um, the past I am here years. because as a parent, and I know of um, countless other parents who feel the same way, that there is not enough um, art education in our schools. Our students this year at Barton Gregorian receive one hour of art education every other week. Uh, but that's the only reason enough. our students are getting more than that one hour of art education every other week is because of risk of funding. And that is why it's critical to keep risk of funded at its current level so that they can continue to provide the means for access to quality arts education in all of our public schools. Without it, I fear that our students will not become the creative, critical thinkers they could be, that they won't use their imaginations to dream big, and without the opportunity that the arts provide to do that kind of dreaming of a better future for all of us. So I just want to thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the importance of risk of funding. So thank you, Wendy. It's Jason Yoon. I'm the executive director of New Urban Arts. Uh, we are a nonprofit art studio and gallery in Providence, Rhode Island. 
Um, our mission is to build a vital community that empowers young people uh, to develop a creative practice that they can sustain uh, throughout their lives. A democracy requires that all young people become more creative and independent thinkers, and that our schools are, are failing our, our, our students in that regard. Um, the majority of our students live in Providence's poorest neighborhoods. Um, we pair them up with artist mentors every year to work in free after school and summer intensive programs. Um, over 90% of our seniors graduate high school and go on to college. Um, and, you know, I think as a nation, as a state, we're, we're facing a bit of an education crisis. Um, our schools and our education system is preparing young people for the past and not, you know, not so much for the future. Um, President Barack Obama said in his State of the Union address that we need to spark the creativity and imagination of our people to, to win the future. Um, and we're really lucky here in Rhode Island because Rhode Island is a national leader in arts education and youth arts programming. I moved from here from New York City three years ago um, to take the position as a director of this, this incredible organization. Um, you know, it's, it's one of our state's greatest strengths, and, you know, RISCA has been an incredible investor in something that the rest of the country is looking at this state for as a My leader. My name is Andrea um, and I'm a I participant in uh, River's Edge. Um, just really quick, a background story about myself. Um, in 2008, I was a high school dropout. I really had, you know, nothing going for me at all. Um, and my mother, you know, urged me to go, you know, try out this place uh, called River's Edge. And, you know, I said, what the heck with it? I'll, I'll go just so I can come back home and play video games and no one can bother me. <laughs> um, two years later, um, I'm a well-respected uh, participant in River's Edge. I have my GED. I'm, I'm in college, currently enrolled in college. I'm a professional freelance photographer. And um, the experiences I had in the past two years have been extraordinary with, with the field that I'm we working in. Dozens yeah. of other participants within River's Edge and all the art programs in Rhode Island. Um, and the reason why I'm saying all of this is because if, if, if these programs aren't supported, one, one year from now, months from now, there's going to be someone just like me, a student somewhere that's not going to have the chance to to, to be part or, or get involved with, with, with an art program like, like I did. And they're not going to have these chances to feel, you know, important for the work that they do. They're not going to learn, you know, these awesome things and have these awesome adventures. And the important thing of that is I hope you guys realize how important that is because we're your future. We, we, we're the future, me, the students, the, 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 the ch we are the future. And what good is our future if these things aren't here to support and, and, and you know, help us grow. I'm Loren Spears, and I'm the executive director from Tomaquag Indian Memorial Museum in Exeter, Rhode Island. And uh, RISCA has been, you know, very pivotal over Tomaquag Museum's long and varied history. We were founded in 1954 in Tomaquag Valley, which was in a village inside the actually a hamlet inside the village of Ashway, inside the town of Hopkinton, true Rhode Island spirit there. Um, and Tomaquag Museum over all these years has been presenting native history and culture through the arts because I truly believe as an indigenous person here that our life ways are wrapped right around the arts. Um, and so over these years and in this recent time, we spend a lot of time teaching traditional arts to native youth to empower them as human beings and as indigenous people and then those art shows are then shown to the public through our museum programming. Everything from basketry, weaving, beadwork, pottery, carving, traditional home building, regalia making, murals, many of which were funded through the Rhode Island State Council uh, on Arts. My name is Angela Brazil and I'm a member of the resident acting company at Trinity Rep. And I just have to say, I have loved hearing, I'm so proud of being a member of this arts community, hearing all these stories this afternoon. Um, and I'm talking oh so briefly about the quality of life issue. It's hard, you know, I wish I could hand you a thing that says, you know, like the budget numbers people can. They can hand you a paper and, uh, that says, here's the income that, that the arts can generate in Rhode Island. Quality of life is, of course, different, as you know. Um, just like Amy was talking about, it's uh, in, the, in a way like arts education. It's there and it's huge. I can't give it to you on paper. But what I can tell you about is my life and what I do. Um, I do what I do because of several reasons, one of them being Trinity Rep. The fact that it's a resident acting company, which is incredibly rare. When I decided to be an actor, I don't know, years ago, um, I 
thought that I would be itinerant, that I would travel from town to town, that I would not be able to have a family and be a part of a community for very long. Trinity Rep has made that possible. But not just Trinity Rep. The arts community in Rhode Island has made that possible. And the leadership that the state of Rhode Island has shown in um, its support for the arts has made that possible. This is a community like no other, and I don't say that lightly. Um, the dedication that its citizens have to the arts is phenomenal. Um, you know, it means that as a resident artist, uh, that must sound like nothing to you guys, but it's everything to me, you know? As a resident artist, I'm a part of a community. That means I have a responsibility to the citizens of this community. I don't leave once a show finishes. I then go to the grocery store, and I see those same people in the grocery store, and they stop me, and we have a conversation about what it is they just saw on stage. Or I'm in the classroom as an arts educator, and I see uh, at the park, when I take my own kids there, um, I see a parent of a child that I just taught, and we have a conversation about what it is their child is learning. It's that continued conversation that makes a quality of life unlike any other. It's possible in Rhode Island because of the size of our state, but it's possible mostly because of the investment in that arts community, both by its artists and by the community at large. Um, I thank you for the investment that you've made in that community, and I hope that your support and leadership will continue to facilitate that continued conversation between artists and the community members of Rhode Island. Thank you. That's going to be tough to follow. I, I, I just oh. think that was just the best promotion for Trinity I've seen. <laughs> Artists. I know. You know. All of us know. can say the same thing. I was looking around and is. watching, listening to Amy and listening to Bert and listening to New Urban Arts, and the amount of work that people do with the money that we have is phenomenal. <laughs> you know. Um, you, you, you're so right. I grew up in Providence, and yeah. I grew up through the '70s and the '80s when it was a ghost town, mm -hmm. and I've seen how the arts have bring back Providence, especially at night. The first yeah. time I went to a restaurant and I couldn't get in, there was a waiting line. I said, "What?" <laughs> And the arts have helped that. Yeah. Well, thank you, um, members of the committee, Mr. Chairman. My name is Lisa Carnaval. I'm the executive director of Rhode Island Citizens for the Arts. We're the statewide advocacy organization for the arts and creative sector. I'm not going to take too much time on, um, ex you know, extrapolating on everything that the testimonies have already showcased for you. I do want to leave you with a few thoughts and sort of just kind of pull it together. Um, I think what we'd really like you to do as members of the, the finance community is to consider these funds as your investment in jobs in Rhode Island, in education in Rhode Island. And I think through the testimonies, you've heard examples of that. Um, but I might offer a different perspective on that. Um, the arts community do not receive tax benefits to bring jobs to Rhode Island. Um, they s receive an access to funds through Rhode Island State Council for the Arts to seed a small amount of their projects and their organizations that then uh, leverages more money into the state of Rhode Island. So you don't only just, you don't only get jobs, you get more economic impact and you get more investment in Rhode Island through that.